Who does the Arctic belong to? The vast region was long seen as little more than snow and ice, but now three world powers, Russia, China and the United States, are leading the charge to take control of the immense natural resources and new trade routes that are opening up, even as a potential climate catastrophe takes hold. So on to the point, we ask, polar power play, who'll win the race for the Arctic's riches? Well, thanks very much for joining us here on To The Point, where my guests are Michael Paul, a specialist on security issues and the Arctic in particular, with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. His opinion, in light of the competing security interests of Russia, China and America, we urgently need a military dialogue. Also with us is the oceanographer and climatologist Stefan Ramsdorf from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He argues that things that happen in the Arctic don't necessarily stay in the Arctic. And a very warm welcome too to Irina Filatova from DW's Russia desk in Bonn, who says the Arctic has vast economic resources and Russia wants a big slice of the cake. Well, thank you all for, uh, three for being with me today. Interesting insights to begin the show. And to get us going, I'd like to begin by asking Michel Paul the uh, apparently uh, straightforward question, who does the Arctic belong to? Oh, that's quite clear. Uh, the mm -hmm. area around the North Pole belongs to human mankind. Mm -hmm. And the rest is clearly defined by international law, the law of the sea. And, yeah. Russia claimed in 2007 that the Arctic is Russia. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Uh, law. Okay, a, a straightforward answer based on principles of law, you say. Why are things so tense around the region at this point in time? Oh, in former times, it was called uh, high north and low tension. But right now, in the uh, years after 2007, when uh, President Putin claimed uh, Russia's return as a world power. Mm -hmm. uh, they started also a remilitarization re in the Arctic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, reactivating former bases from the Cold War times and so on. Okay. Stefan Ransdorf, you are the scientist in our ranks, and I'd like you to ask you the same question. Who does the Arctic belong to? Because I anticipate we might get a different answer. Well, I think that the, the whole Arctic Ocean should be declared as a common heritage of humanity mm -hmm. and the nations should pull together to protect the Arctic. Is that likely to happen? Um, it's, uh, it's happened in Antarctica, so it's not out of the question. And we are in an unprecedented climate crisis. The Arctic is warming three times faster than the whole globe. The ice is melting away, and this is affecting all nations mm -hmm. through sea level rise, from melting Greenland ice, through the effects on the jet stream and our weather systems uh, in the mid latitudes, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's bring in I Irina Filatova from Bonn. Uh, Irina, why is the region suddenly so important? Everybody's talking about it much more than they were. Uh, what's brought this together to sort of create the interest? Well, I wouldn't say that it suddenly got so important. Uh, the interest uh, in the Arctic has been there for decades. Uh, it's just that, like Mikhail Pao already said, um, Russia declared its return to the Arctic 2007. And uh, clearly, there has come more realization from other countries uh, about the strategic importance of this region. And of course, also Arctic got in the, sp the spotlight um, in connection with uh, the estimates um, uh, of uh, scientific estimates. Uh, it's about the uh, enormous potential resources that are uh, hidden in the Arctic. And of course, um, like we said in the introduction, everybody wants, wants a big slice of pie. This is why uh, the countries have intensified, uh, the Arctic countries have intensified their uh, activities in the Arctic, have started to show more ambition, but not even them. I mean, look at China. They also um, have declared themselves a near Arctic country, although they don't don't even have a direct access to the Arctic Ocean. Mm. What does the Arctic mean to ordinary Russians? I'm sorry? What does the Arctic mean to ordinary Russians? You're talking a lot about sort of, you know, resources and history and what have you, but what about, you know, the Russian soul? 
Well, I need to say that Russians are very proud of uh, the Arctic. Uh, there are many examples of that. Um, for example, Arctic has become a um, huge part of the Russian cultural legacy. There are um, a lot of um, books written about it, uh, a lot of uh, fairy tales, a lot of films have been made in Russia about uh, the Arctic exploration. There is also one fun fact. Um, actually, there is in Moscow um, a special house, which is called uh, the House of uh, Polar Researchers, the House of Arctic Researchers. Mm -hmm. It was. It is also actually part of the um, architectural legacy in Russia. It's um, a historical, uh, it's a memorial right now. But the house was built in the 1930s um, for the Arctic researchers and their families. Um, and uh, it's still functioning as a residential house. I mean, people live there still, yeah? Okay. It's even possible to buy apartments over there. But back then, in the 30s, I mean, it was actually um, decorated and built uh, like in a very fancy way, I mean, to provide as more comfort for the people who work in the Arctic as possible, kind of compensate for the severe conditions they have to work in. Okay. Um, Irina, but if Irina, we speak of the... Yeah, let me just cut in, because I think I, I, I can sense your passion and I can understand the message. It's all about prestige. And I could hear you, Michel, sort of nodding in the background, yeah, that the prestige and a kind of... It, it's, rem, it's reminiscent a little bit of the sort of the Cold War, you know, space race almost. Yeah, it's... I just wanted to add that there are also the darker sides of the Arctic, of the Russian Arctic, which began in Tsarist times with the prisoner camps and ended with Alexander Solzhenitsyn's uh, Gulag. Uh, so that's the dark side of the Arctic. And uh, clearly it became a hotspot now uh, because of uh, uh, interests of, uh, in, in, in the context of great power rivalry. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that uh, yeah, China has declared itself a near Arctic state. And everybody was uh, a little bit surprised because geographically it makes no sense. OK, we'll, t we'll talk about that just to, yeah, in, okay. in just a second. The, the, the Chinese, the Russians and the Americans, sort of a three-way race for uh, a power grab, essentially. Stefan, you said something at the beginning of the show that I thought was very interesting. Things that happen in the Arctic don't necessarily stay in the Arctic. What, what do you mean? Well... The Arctic is, is a very vulnerable ecosystem and mm. vulnerable region. And one of the key factors in terms of climate is that it reflects a lot of sunlight by the bright ice and snow surfaces. And as these uh, shrink, the global warming is amplified. And even just shipping activities in the Arctic make the ice shrink faster because there are soot emissions which settle on the bright snow and ice surfaces, make them darker, and that uh, helps to heat up the globe. And then when the Greenland ice sheet melts, there is a tipping point there which you know, could be reached even below two degrees of warming, which will mean that eventually it will take a long time, but we will get about seven meters of global sea level rise uh, if we push Greenland past that tipping point. And then obviously the coast uh, worldwide will be massively impacted by that. OK, let's just get some images that will give us a feel for what is at stake in the rivalry that we've already touched on and the environmental factors that Stefan has been speaking about. The Arctic is warming more quickly than any other place on Earth. From the 7.6 million square kilometers of ice that were there 40 years ago, only half that amount remains. In the next decade, there could be no ice there during the summertime. That would make raw materials like oil and gas more accessible, as well as rare earths and precious metals. It would be a billion dollar treasure industry. Five countries within the Arctic Circle each have a 370 kilometer wide zone, the USA, Canada, Denmark, Norway, and Russia. But a huge area around the North Pole doesn't belong to any of them. So far, Russia has laid the strongest claim to it. But China also has strong ambitions, and the country has already secured rare earths in Greenland. China now sees itself as a near Arctic state because of the Northeast Passage, which has eased maritime travel and shortened distances. China's goal is a polar silk road. Exploiting the Arctic. At what price? Stefan, let's come back to that question. Exploiting the Arctic, at what price exactly? Give us a, a, more of a picture of that. 
Well, I have mentioned sea level rise. There's also the Gulf Stream system, which has a huge influence on the climate, not only around the North Atlantic, even down to the tropics. And we have recently uh, published a study with much stronger evidence that this system is already slowing, mm -hmm. partly due to meltwater from Greenland diluting the oceans in the north. And there is also growing evidence that the disproportionate warming of the Arctic is affecting the jet stream and uh, it makes the polar vortex more unstable. So this exceptional cold air outbreaks into North America, into Europe in this January and February have to do with the extreme warming of the Arctic. And so even our weather in the United States, in Europe is affected by these changes going on in the Arctic. Mm. It's interesting. I found a quote from you yourself. You say to continue to trying to dig up fossil fuels is absurd. And you appear to be say, saying not just we're not just digging out resources, but we're digging our own graves. It's pretty drastic. Well, yes, all nations have agreed in the Paris Agreement to limit global warming to well below two degrees, if possible, 1.5 degrees. And that means we have a limited amount of fossil fuels we can still burn. And the known reserves are already about three times larger. So we have a lot of fossil fuel reserves that are just unburnable carbon, as it's the technical term is. Mm -hmm. And so it's stupid to spend a lot of money to look for more. And in highly vulnerable, risky places like the Arctic, that's especially stupid. OK, so th that, you might say, is the, is the, is the price, P-R-I-C-E. Irina, meanwhile, there is a prize here, P-R-I-Z-E, because, the, I mean, we're looking at incredible resources here, politic, uh, oil, gas, precious metals, gold, uranium and so on. Uh, who's, gonna who's going to profit most? Well, uh... The one who's the first is going to profit most, of course, um, because we know that there are huge resources. I mean, they're not proven yet, but they're suggested there are huge resources in the Arctic. And uh, Russia, for example, already is trying to claim its right for more uh, parts of the offshore. Uh, for example, the Lomonosov Ridge, um, it already applied with the United Nations. Um, and. Lomonosov Ridge is actually the part of the shelf where actually huge uh, reserves of the um, uh, raw materials uh, are supposed to be. And if Russia managed to get approval from the United States, from the United Nations, and if um, actually um, there is a confirmation that Russia can claim these parts of the shelf for themselves, then Russia will be able to um, develop this um, potential oil and gas field. Another question is whether it's uh, economically viable for Russia to do so. It's very difficult. I mean, imagine you have to work in the severe Arctic condition in a very sensitive environment. It's uh, a lot of money, really. Does Russia have it? Not necessarily, because we're in the pandemic. I mean, we see that the Russian economy is actually not doing so well recently. Uh, and also the question of technology matters. Uh, Russia does not necessarily have enough technology to go forward with all these projects. And uh, we can see, for example, the um, uh, Stockman uh, project uh, in the uh, in, in the Arctic. Uh, it's a project to develop conden to uh, extract condensate gas. Um, it uh, has been put on ice for the next few years because Russia acknowledges they don't have enough technology to go forward with it. So it's a huge question. I mean, uh, so, so no matter knows, who the, who's the first. Russia knows where it wants to go, but it's not quite sure how it's going to get there. You could say exactly. Or, uh, Michelle, I'd just like to come back to that, the, the point that we were talking about, about uh, the, the colonial legacy almost, or the colonial feel to all this. You know, we talk a lot about the race, about a charge, about a push, about a power play, and about plunder and about countries winning their booty. It's all very reminiscent of the colonial period, the colonial legacy. Tell us a little bit more about that. With respect to Greenland, for example, uh, clearly the colonial legacy is uh, still existing and reminds uh, uh, Greenlanders uh, that they have to, uh, say, they have still to, to work for independence by, for example, exploiting rare earths. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the uh, issues uh, the whole debate on the Arctic goes about. Uh, because that was the interest uh, clearly the Chinese people had mm -hmm. in, in Greenland. And that was also attractive to uh, US President Donald Trump, you remember, 
yeah. uh, who wanted to buy Greenland because of rare earth and because of the geostrategic importance of Greenland, clearly. Mm. So there are very many aspects. Mm. Stefan, one really interesting thing about this story about the future of, of the Arctic is that it brings together military issues, geopolitical issues, uh, uh, economic issues and environmental issues. I know you're a person of ideas. Can you somehow weave that all together to sort of explain how those, uh, the interdependence of those factors? Well, this is a tough question, yeah. <laughs> and, but I, I would say what's going on now with, with the race for resources in the Arctic and, and economic benefits is very much a kind of a 20th century thing, and we're now in the 21st century. We're in a climate crisis which threatens uh, civilization as we know it, mm -hmm. and we all live together on this one fragile planet, and uh, we shouldn't be working against each other, especially not in the Arctic, but also not anywhere else. We, we need to work together to solve this crisis. Okay. Uh, the Arctic, once a demilitarized zone, is now rapidly being militarized. In essence, as we've already seen, it's a freeway race for power and influence. For the first time, the U.S. Air Force is deploying B-1 bombers to Norway. Just a few weeks after his inauguration, President Biden is sending a message to Russia. The USA is prepared to defend its allies against potential Russian aggression. Experts see it as a signal that the U.S. doesn't want to lose its claim to the Arctic. The race for new economic opportunities in the Arctic has brought with it militarization. The Kremlin says Russia has been arming itself in the north for years by building army bases to defend its territory and legitimate interests. S-400 missiles can reach Greenland or Alaska. NATO responded to the maneuver with large-scale military exercises like the Trident Juncture War Games in Norway in 2018. For decades, the Arctic was regarded as a conflict-free zone. How dangerous is this armament? Irina, in Bonn, there's a tendency to blame the Russians for the militarization of the Arctic. Is that fair? Well, um, I mean, you have to say it that way. Russia has been seen and still is seen by many countries in the world, also by, the, by its neighbor countries, and is an aggressor. Uh, we can see the Baltic state. Look at the Baltic states. Uh, they are very much concerned about potential uh, Russian aggression. So um, it's clear that uh, the countries. Um, have some concerns, so to say, about uh, Russia's expanding military presence in Russia. So, um, and they're not wrong. Vladimir Putin would surely come in now and say that Russia's coastline makes 53% of the Arctic Ocean. There are two million Russians living in the Arctic region. He would say it's, it's good and right that Russia is the top dog, that, uh, that Russia is the most important nation in the region. Well, um, Russia is not the most important nation in the region. First of all, let's say that way, uh, most of the resources which are proven in the Arctic, they um, actually already, they are allocated in the Russian part of the shelf. It's clear, it's over 90 percent. So it's, we don't argue with that. But uh, if we say, fr see from the point of view who Arctic belongs to, I mean, of course, there is the international re legislation which regulates the issue, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which says that every country only has the first 200 sea miles uh, for itself, uh, and not more. And if you want more, you have to go through a long procedure. So uh, basically, Russia uh, is tied by the international legislation, just exactly like all other countries. OK, Michel Paul, uh, China, for its part, we mentioned it already, has called it, has decided to call itself a near-Arctic state. What should we understand there? What, is a, what are the Chinese ambitions and how threatening may they be for some? Well, clearly, Chinese interests and ambitions are far-reaching, and um, when, you, when, you call the, when you call the Polar Silk Road as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, you have uh, the, the term polar. So it's not only the Arctic, but it's also the Antarctic. So mm -hmm. you have a global ambition. Yeah. 
uh, with that respect. And uh, further on, uh, we are, we are uh, the interests of China in Greenland, for example, are well known. Uh, China already now is um, the world leader in the production of rare earth uh, elements. So it's really the dom a dominant player and wants even to, to extend that, uh, that dominant uh, status. Mm. So there are very many aspects uh, concerning uh, China, especially in its cooperation with Russia. And um, that's uh, in the field of naval cooperation, clearly uh, something uh, people are concerned about. Mm. Stefan. If you were, if you had the opportunity to be a German representative in a meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin to talk about uh, the future of the region, what would you ask for? What would you recommend? Well, I, I would probably say that uh, we, we need a new era of global cooperation and after the US elections there's more hope for that because we are facing a common enemy and that is global heating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you, uh, there's, a, there's a new man in the White House, obviously, Joe Biden. Are you, uh, as a climatologist, are you encouraged by his pres presence in the, in the White House? Because he's also, mm. you know, when it comes to the Arctic, he's been, he's been relatively mm, belligerent, is not the word, but he's been very gung-ho so far. Well, in terms of climate change, I am very encouraged um, because I, I know John Kerry, for example, personally, who is a mm. very good climate diplomat, very... Um, passionate about the topic and he, he got the right advisors now some of my uh, really excellent climate science colleagues uh, from the US are mm -hmm. advising the presidency and uh, I think um, I think he has said something like the United States is back leading on the climate issue I don't think they ever have but I think they are now gearing up to be a leader on the climate mm -hmm. issue mm. Who's, got, who's going to be the lead player? The, the, there are tensions, there are at least three... Well, just one question. There are smaller nations involved as well. And you were talking... Before we came on air, you were talking, Michelle, about your concerns about uh, Sweden, for example. Just share a little bit of that for, with us. Well, Sweden just has uh, written in its uh, most recent Arctic strategy that uh, there are a military dynamic which they are concerned about, and that's clearly... Uh, a concern also the other Scandinavian uh, countries share, like Norway. Mm -hmm. There's an organization called the Arctic Council. We need to mention them. Sort of uh, explain who they are and what they're, you know, what we oh, might the, hope from them. Oh, the chair will go from Iceland uh, to Russia in May uh, of this year. So we will have Russia uh, chairing the Arctic Council for the next two years. And I'm yeah, hopefully there will be a meeting, uh, not only of the uh, foreign ministers, but also uh, with John Kerry in Reykjavik in May, so they could exchange views about uh, the future of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Irina, are you optimistic from a Russian perspective about, uh, about possible talks between the players uh, in terms of creating a, a more uh, rules-based future for the region? Well, I hope so, uh, at least when it comes to uh, the climate change issue, because there was kind of uh, a wake-up call, wake call for Russia last year, in uh, in the summer of last year, uh, when there was a huge um, diesel spill from the facilities of Norilsk Nickel, the Russia's biggest nickel producer in Siberia, and a lot of uh, fuel got into two Siberian rivers. And this, uh, Russia doesn't want to speak about that openly apparently but this happened because of the thawing permafrost um, because this reservoir where the fuel was contained it was standing on the permafrost um, so this is kind of a wake-up call for russia i hope they now will turn their eyes a bit more to the climate change issue and we'll talk about that more and we'll be ready to cooperate in this direction more are you optimistic that the americans can influence the russians in this way that they can seek dialogue and create dialogue well, I make no political judgment as a natural scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Mikhail, you said at the beginning of the show, we need military dialogue and we need it urgently. That's going to give me sleepless nights. Why do we need military dialogue urgently? No, because uh, Russia and uh, the Americans should talk about uh, military issues in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, the experts uh, quite, uh, quite agree about that point uh, in both Moscow and Washington that there should be a dialogue as soon as possible. 
Okay. Last question on the show. The question I asked at the beginning: Who will win the race for the Arctic riches? Stefan Ramsdorf. <laughs> Well, I hope we all together will win and it shouldn't be a race against each other. Mm -hmm. Michel? Yeah, I'm an optimist too. <laughs> <laughs> an optimist too. And Irina in, uh, in, in Bonn from the Russia, DW's Russia desk in Bonn, who is going to win the race for the Arctic's riches? Well, it's not about who's going to win the race. It's about uh, that we don't destroy the sensitive environment, I would say. And there has to be a common responsibility of all the countries involved. Thank you all three for being with us today. We've been discussing the future of the Arctic. I hope things uh, develop well and peacefully in the future. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show as much as I have and we've given you some food for thought, do come back next time round. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.